A reading from Luke. <clears throat> Zechariah, John's father, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Blessed are you, the Most High God of Israel, for you have visited and redeemed your people. You have raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of David, as you promised through the mouths of your Holy One, the prophets of ancient times salvation from our enemies and from the hands of all our foes. You have shown mercy to our ancestors by remembering the holy covenant you made with them, the oath you swore to Sarah and Abraham, granting that we, delivered from the hands of our enemies, might serve you without fear, in holiness and justice, in your presence all our days. And you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you'll go before our God to prepare the way for the promised one, giving the people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Such is the tender mercy of our God, who from on high will bring the rising sun to visit us, to give light to those who live in darkness and the shadow of death and guide our feet into the way of peace. In the meantime, the child grew up and became strong in the spirit. He lived out in the desert until the day he appeared openly in Israel. Today, the second reading also comes from the Gospel of Luke. In the 15th year of the rule of the Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea and Herod was ruler over Galilee, his brother Philip was ruler over Ituria and Trachonitis, and Licinius was ruler over Abilene during the high priesthood of Anaphas and, and Caiaphas. God's word came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. John went throughout the region of the Jordan River, calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive their sins. This is just as it was written in the scroll of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a herald's voice in the desert crying, make, ray the, make ready the way of our God. Clear a straight path. Every valley will be filled and every mountain and hill will be leveled. The twisted paths will be made straight and the rough road smooth and all humankind will see the salvation of God. So, since the age of 18, I have always had a passionate love for airports. Just being in them, wandering around the terminals, walking on those moving walkways where you go faster for a little bit, and then there's that one jarring step when you're back on the solid ground. Working my way through the crowds, just landing from God knows what part of the country I used to look forward to layovers just because it was a chance to walk around some random airport somewhere. I've always kind of wanted to look into becoming an airport chaplain. I have no idea what an airport chaplain does, except I know you hang out in an airport all day and do clergy stuff, which is enough. There's just an energy of migration in the air in an airport. Everyone is in motion making some big trip to a new place or returning to an old place, going back to a place of respite. I believe there is an inherent sacredness to travel, and I love being able to walk through crowds, knowing that we're not only all in motion, moving in orbitals around one another, but that we're all going somewhere, somewhere that means something, somewhere important. If you can pick up on that energy of migration, it's a rush. And the interesting thing about that is that I'm also not a crazy person because nobody likes airports. They're awful. It's a bunch of us packed into tight spaces for hours at a time having to deal with the weird habits and body odors and noise of a couple hundred strangers all day. It's the T times 20. 
sitting in rigid chairs, praying, paying for overpriced fast food, walking around, trying to find anywhere to sit down, especially in the age of COVID where we have to leave half the seats empty. Everyone lugging heavy baggage around that you can't put down or else the TSA will think it's a bomb. You can't smoke without having to go through security again. Everyone's stressed. No one wants to be there. And this notion of movement that I just said is a complete farce. No one moves in an airport. You sit at the gate, and then you sit on a plane, and then you stand by the baggage carousel, and then you leave. There is no movement. It's all waiting. And I am keenly aware of this tension where something I love so much can also be just objectively terrible. I don't find this surprising because airports are one example of what I think of as middle places, what in academia they might call liminal spaces, places that are between, places of transition, places that are not really even places in their own right, but places that are meant to get you to another place. No one goes to the airport just to be at the airport. Either you work there, you're picking someone up, or you're going there on your way to somewhere else. And not a lot of significant events happen in the middle places. The new explorations, the joyful reunions, the embrace of nostalgia, the place of rest, all of these things come after the middle places. In the middle places, you wait and you watch and you walk. You check the time, you listen for the announcements, you put foot before foot for hours. You sit and observe, you mind your essential belongings. No one really goes anywhere or does anything in the middle places, and yet these are the places where the going and the doing, and most importantly, the becoming happens. These are the places where we prepare, where we reflect, readjust, re-examine, where the actual journey takes place. Once we've arrived, we've arrived. But the middle places are about all of the steps between the origin and the destination, the long process of arriving. They're some of the most fundamental places to our journeys and our processes of development, but also, in general, we don't like journeys and processes as much as we like arriving and finishing. And I bring this all up because the texts today are about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, for one thing, occupied the middle places, being the wilderness all the time, between cities and homelands, places where one goes to fast and pray and reflect and encounter the divine, where one too must walk through the heat and the loneliness on your way to somewhere else. But also, John the Baptist is a sort of middle place himself. He's the beginning of the steps towards Jesus and the miracles and the crucifixion and resurrection and the global rise of the Christian church. He starts that process and he is killed before the process is finished, meaning his mark will always be in the beginnings and the middle places between the world shrouded in darkness and the world in which light shines on all. His call represents the beginning of movement towards the redemption of the world. And that is exciting. There are the beginnings of great signs and wonders coming from the hill country at this time. Prophecies are being spoken two, three times per chapter. The fruits of divine action can be readily seen and also, there's plenty about this dawning of a new era of God's salvation that is not really all that fun for those experiencing it firsthand. Zechariah is rendered speechless for nine months, sitting in his own sort of middle space of introspection privately. Jesus, after his baptismal encounter, proceeds immediately into the wilderness where he fasts and is tested for 40 days. John is imprisoned and beheaded. And let's also remember that before the redemption of this story even begins, we also have to journey through the flog, the cross, and the tomb. None of this miraculous new world comes immediately, and all of it comes at a cost. There is waiting and walking and preparing to be done. 
And we must journey through the middle places before we can arrive at salvation. And our current liturgical season is also, in a way, a sort of middle place. Advent is a season of waiting, expectation, and preparation. It is, with the sole exception of Holy Saturday, I believe, just about the only portion of our liturgical calendar in which Jesus is not present in the story. It's a time for us to reflect on what a world without God's redemption looks like and to wait for that redemption to come in its fullness. Advent, in its way, mirrors the real middle place that we are all in between the resurrection and the revelation, a journey that has started and still not reached its completion, what Pauline scholars would call an already but not yet, the beginnings of light entering the world, and the reflection on the time before when the night covered us all in its shadows and its doubt. It is a time so synonymous with the journey towards a better world that Advent comes from the same root word as adventure. So, of course, we hate Advent. I don't mean to speak for every single one of us, but in a societal sense, we're really not enthusiastic about the season of waiting. We'd rather skip right to Christmas. And a great many of us do so, and then some. Stores start putting out trees in August. Decorations go up just as soon as the Halloween ones come down. This year, for the first time, I actually heard people saying, oh boy, it's September 1st. Time to start celebrating Christmas. Four months. Instead of four weeks of waiting and 12 days of celebration, we're opting to skip even waiting for the summer heat to die down and proceeding instead directly into a sort of mega Christmas, a season that demands so much importance that it must consume fully one third of the calendar year. And God forbid you even mention any other day of significance that occurs in that time period, lest you be considered an enemy combatant in the war on Christmas. The ultimate irony being that so many of those who insist that Christmas be a four-month titan of a holiday are the exact same people who declare Christmas officially over the morning of Boxing Day when we've got 11 days to go. But that's us as a species in general. We don't like to wait. We don't like to prepare. We don't want a journey into becoming something greater. We just want to be something greater now. Skip right past any of the reflection or the work of preparation and take me straight to the arrival in paradise. And we've actually done a pretty good job of bending the rules so that we can do more arriving and spend less time in the middle places. Christmas starts immediately after August now, I guess. We can communicate instantaneously with one another where those before us would have had to wait hours to get to a phone or telegraph where those before them waited weeks and months for a letter, we can fly in less than a day to faraway continents that would have taken months of hard travel before. In one of the sources that I consulted when reading up on this text, a writer named Wesley D. Avram observed that we have, in our way, achieved much of John the Baptist's prophecy. The crooked paths have been abandoned in favor of smooth, straight paths cut clear and paved over with asphalt. We can walk the short length of a bridge where once one was forced to descend into the valley, and we've carved tunnels through the hills and mountains. We are living in a version of John the Baptist's eschatological vision, and the irony is it's still not fast enough. It's still too much waiting. We want to teleport or apparate or beam each other up and down for all the Star Trek fans that are apparently in this room. We've cut the wait time down from months to weeks to days to hours, and we still spend our time complaining that we won't be happy until the laws of space and time undo themselves and we can appear in a new place instantaneously. We've forsaken letters that take weeks to send for a phone that can transmit a message halfway across the world in a second, and we still get upset when someone doesn't text us back right away. 
We live in a world where we can skip the mountains, valleys, and crooked paths altogether and just spend a few hours flying above the earth until we come back down two continents away, and we hate it. Flying is a miserable experience that everyone holds their nose through. And again, we all pack ourselves onto a giant metal tube that flies into the freaking sky and remains airborne for hours at a time until it can safely land in a city that would have taken us days to drive to or weeks by boat. And we complain about it because it's too much time spent waiting. And the more we speed things up to get past the waiting, the more impatient we get. Our feelings aren't eased by the reduction in wait time. We don't even remember half the time that there is a reduction in wait time. We don't, we just know that there's a thing we want to happen and it hasn't happened yet and it upsets us. We can cut the wait time as short as we want but it won't make us any happier and we'll never stop being impatient and wanting things right away. And the other thing about that is that every single reduction in the wait time, every minute we skip out of spending in the middle places, every time we take a long arduous journey and make it easier through human innovation, it always comes at a cost. As Thomas Paine wrote, what we obtain too easily, we esteem too lightly. And in the process of skipping over the wait times and middle places, we began too to cheapen the arrival, the redemption, the destination. In our haste to experience God's salvation and redemption, we skip ahead. So that instead of the redemption of the world, the liberation of all God's people, the power that overturns death in the face of empire, we exchange that for a more easily obtained redemption that pardons us and those who think like us, so long as we try really hard to be good. The crowds in the baptismal scene wanted to skip ahead and name John the Baptist their new Messiah, and if he had let them, it would have been a quick end to the movement when John the Baptist was beheaded and didn't come back three days later. And we too want to find anything close to God and pretend that it's the promised land just to avoid doing any more walking. For God's sake, look what we've made of Christmas. The coming of Jesus into the world was hailed as a seismic shift in the order of the cosmos. Angels came down to proclaim peace to the lowest in society. People spoke of all difficulty being removed and any hindrance to God's people worshiping her being obliterated. And what does Christmas mean to us? Hallmark movies. An endless loop of the same 12 songs in every public place and on every radio station. Marathon shopping days so frenzied that there's a count of the death toll. Giant stores putting displays out to convince people to come in and spend money. No peace on earth, no goodwill towards men, no goodwill from God to humankind beginning and never ceasing, no weary world rejoicing, just a thousand pictures of snow and ribbons and some great deals for Toyotathon. And the more we stretch that holiday season out, the less it means I have come to know in my time what addiction looks like, and this is it doing more and more and feeling less and less. You increase the amount, chasing some feeling you had long ago, but you never recapture that feeling for long enough. And every step you take trying to find it brings you further away. This is what we're doing with Christmas. We stretch it into a months long occasion, but it doesn't make us feel like it once did and it doesn't mean what it once did. And every year we expect more and feel less. And I want to just make a quick aside to say that those of us who identify as Christians and believe that Christmas is somehow under attack are the worst offenders. They don't care if Christmas means spreading goodwill and cheer to the less fortunate and being grateful for the abundance in our own lives. They don't care about peace on earth or a weary world. They're upset because there are no snowmen on the Starbucks cups. And sometimes people acknowledge that other holidays also happen around this time of year. 
They are no closer to the root of Christmas than the rest of us, just more adamant that every public place must acknowledge Mega Christmas by name and decorate accordingly. Because they don't want to put in the work. They haven't taken the time, haven't thought it through. That's what middle places are for, and we hate middle places. Now, the theme of the second Sunday in Advent, which everybody, I think, knows because we were talking about it earlier, is peace. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in his letter from a Birmingham jail that the great stumbling block to progress for racial equality comes in the form of the moderate who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. Now, this refers specifically to a societal peace in the midst of the struggle for racial justice, but I firmly believe the same framework could be applied to an inner sense of peace in our personal lives. You can skip ahead to a negative peace. Do a good vibes only thing. Tell everyone about the power of positive thinking and write live, laugh, love on all your home decor, but that won't bring you real enduring peace or positivity. It won't help you weather the storms of life. It won't help you learn to be steady in the face of trouble. And eventually, you're going to run out of good vibes. And the ensuing wrath will show you for a hypocrite. Because peace takes time to obtain. Peace means you have to examine your life to find out what is preventing you from peace. And then you have to deal with those things slowly, deliberately, over the course of years, at which point you'll find more stuff that's standing in between you and inner peace, and you'll have to deal with that stuff. It's a long and difficult process. And it requires a very long time of waiting and working and watching, all in the middle place between beginning to build peace within yourself and achieving it. And you can try to fake it. Sweep all your baggage under the rug and pretend you've already got it all figured out, but the destination won't be as meaningful if you decide to fly there instead of walking. So too, on a societal level, we can try to call this peace. Invent some justifications for why so many still suffer. Tell ourselves they're really bringing it on themselves. We can sweep all our problems under the rug. Police brutality, political corruption, greed, indifference to the poor and suffering, control over women's bodies, bigotry, and hatred. Better yet, we can tell ourselves that this peace only applies to those in our own circles. Maybe even invent some theological doctrine that says all the right people will suddenly be taken up to heaven and everyone else will be left here to suffer, even though there's nothing in the Bible that remotely suggests that. Uh, tell ourselves that peace is elsewhere and God will take us there when the time is right. We can let our impatience get the best of us and call this peace right now, but I don't think anyone will be fooled by that. And to get to the real enduring peace that covers us all and makes the world new, we're going to have to remove a lot of stumbling blocks of our own first. And the longer we all try to skip the journey and get right to the good part, the greater will be the impediments we are throwing in our own way. So it would probably be best for all involved if we stopped trying to teleport and just started walking. Thank you. <laughs>